All right. Welcome back to Rockford Reading Daily. We are continuing to read Class uh, Women, Race, and Class by Angela Davis. Let's pick up on the middle of page 65 where we left off at on the previous episode. Even the most radical white abolitionists, basing their opposition to slavery on moral and humanitarian grounds, failed to understand that the rapidly developing capitalism of the North was also an oppressive system. They view slavery as a detestable and inhumane institution, an archaic transgression of justice. But they did not recognize that the white worker in the North, his or her status as, quote, free, end quote, laborer, notwithstanding, was no different from the enslaved, quote, worker, end quote, in the South. Both were victims of economic exploitation. As militant as William Lloyd Garrison is supposed to have been, he was vehemently against wage laborers' right to organize. The inaugural issue of The Liberator included an article denouncing the efforts of Boston workers to form a political party. Quote, an attempt has been made, it is still in the making, we regret to say, to inflame the minds of our working classes against the more opulent and to persuade men that they are condemned and oppressed by a wealthy arist aristocracy. Aristocracy, excuse me. <clears throat> it is in the highest degree criminal, therefore, to exasperate our mechanics to deeds of violence or to array them under a party banner. End quote. As a rule, white abolitionists either defended the industrial capitalist or expressed no conscious class loyalty at all. This unquestioning acceptance of the capitalist economic system was evident in the program of the women's rights movement as well. If most abolitionists view slavery as a nasty blemish which needed to be eliminated, most women's writers viewed male supremacy in a similar manner, as an immoral flaw in their otherwise acceptable society. The leaders of the women's rights movement did not suspect that the enslavement of black people in the South, the economic exploitation of northern workers, and the social oppression of women might be systematically related. Within the early women's movement, little was said about white working people, not even about white women workers. Though many of the women were supporters of the abolitionist campaign, they failed to integrate their anti-slavery consciousness into their analysis of women's oppression. At the outbreak of the Civil War, the women's rights leaders were persuaded to redirect their energies toward a defense of the Union cause. But in suspending their agitation for sexual equality, they learned how deeply racism had planted itself in the soil of U.S. society. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Mott, and Susan B. Anthony traveled throughout the states of New York delivering pro-union lectures demanding, quote, immediate and unconditional emancipation, end quote. Quote, and they received the rough, roughest treatment of their lives at the hands of aroused mobs in every city where they stopped between Buffalo and Albany. In Syracuse, the hall was invaded by a crowd of men brandishing knives and pistols, end quote. If they had not previously recognized that the South held no monopoly on racism, their experiences, experiences as agitators for the Union cause should have taught them that there was indeed racism in the North and that it could be brutal. When the military draft was instituted in the North, large scale riots in major urban centers were fomented by pro-slavery forces. They brought violence and death to the free black population. In July 1863, Mobs in New York City, quote, destroyed the recruiting stations, set fire to an armory, attacked the Tribune and prominent Republicans, burned a Negro orphan asylum and generally created chaos throughout the city. The mobs directed their, fu their fury, especially against the Negroes, assailing them wherever found. Many were murdered. It is calculated that some 1000 people were killed and wounded, end quote. If the degree to which the North itself was infected with racism had formerly gone unrecognized, the mob violence of 1863 demonstrated that anti-black sentiment was deep and widespread and potentially murderous. If the South had a monopoly on slavery, it was certainly not alone in its sponsorship of racism. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony had agreed with the radical abolitionists that the Civil War could be hastily ended by emancipating the slaves and recruiting them into the Union Army. They attempted to rally masses of women to their position by issuing a call to organize a women's loyal league. At the founding meeting, hundreds of women agreed to promote the war effort by circulating petitions demanding the emancipation of the slaves. 
They were not so unanimous, however, in their response to Susan B. Anthony's resolution linking the rights of women to the liberation of black people. The proposed resolution stated that there can never be a true peace in this republic until the, quote, civil and political rights of all citizens of African descent and all women, end quote, are practically established. Unfortunately, in light of the post-war developments, it appears that this resolution may have been motivated by the fear that white women might be left behind when the slaves emerged into the light of freedom. But Angela Grimke proposed the principled defense of the unity between black liberation and women's liberation. Quote, I want to be identified with the Negro, end quote, she insisted. Quote, until he gets his rights, we shall never have ours, end quote. Quote, I rejoice exceedingly that the resolution should combine us with the Negro. I feel that we have been with him, that the iron has entered into our souls. True, we have not felt the slaveholders lash. True, we have not had our hands manacled, but our hearts have been crushed. End quote. At this founding convention of the Women's Lawyer League, to which all the veterans of the abolitionist campaign and the women rights movement were invited, Angela Grimke characteristically proposed the most advanced interpretation of the war she described as, quote, our second revolution, end quote. Quote, the war is not, as the South falsely pretends, a war of races, nor of sections, nor of political parties, but a war of principles, a war upon the working classes, whether white or black. In this war, the black man was the first victim, the working man of whatever color the next. And now all who contend for the rights of labor, for free speech, free schools, free suffrage and a free government are driven to do battle in defense of these or to fall with them. Victims of the same violence that for two centuries has held the black man a prisoner of war. While the South has waged this war against human rights, the North has stood by holding the garments of those who were stoning liberty to death. The nation is in a death struggle. It must either become one vast slaveocracy of petty tyrants or wholly the land of the free. End quote. Angela Grimke's brilliant quote addressed to the soldiers of our second revolution, end quote, demonstrated that her political consciousness was far more advanced than most of her contemporaries. In her speech, she proposed a radical theory and practice which could have been realized through an alliance embracing labor, black people and women. If, as Karl Marx said, quote, labor in a white skin can never be free as long as labor in a black skin is branded, end quote. It was also true, as Angela Grimke lucidly insisted, that the democratic struggles of the times, especially the fight for women's equality, could be most effectively waged in association with the struggle for black liberation. Uh, and then that's the end of chapter three. And that brings us to the beginning of chapter four, racism in the women's suffrage movement. And I think that some of the, the main uh, ideas that stood out in those last few pages of chapter three was the importance of being able to identify and articulate the similarities that uh, different groups of marginalized people have within a society and how the society is not uh, built on just one of those uh, forms of oppression or forms of exploitation, but how it's built around each each set of oppression and exploitation and how each uh, set props up the other one. And so... Uh, one of the things that I've I've commonly heard is that uh, racism and classism, racism and classism, racism and capitalism uh, were created simultaneously. And there's no way to uh, address one of them without addressing the other one. And I think that's true for even the issues that fall under the umbrella of both racism and classism when it comes to uh, police terrorism and mass incarceration and uh, those things have uh, multiple umbrellas that fall underneath them. You know, Islamophobia is something that falls into the uh, issue of police terrorism and mass incarceration. Uh, uh, xenophobia is something that uh, falls into those things. And I just think that uh, one of the most important parts of this chapter that we just read is uh, understanding and being able to identify how not only the subjugation in which you may uh, deal with is connected to... Uh, is connected to other forms of subjugation or it's connected to the issues in the society, but how being able to identify and articulate how uh, other forms of subjugation and oppression and exploitation is connected to the form that you deal with. And then it's connected to the issues in the society overall. And so here I'm going to end this segment here and then,
we'll pick back up with chapter four, same episode, just a different segment. All right, let's pick back up on chapter four. Chapter four, racism in the woman's suffrage movement. Although this may remain a question for politicians to wrangle over for five or 10 years, the black man is still, in a political point of view, far above the educated white women of the country. The representative women of the nation have done their uttermost for the last 30 years to secure freedom for the Negro. And as long as he was the lowest in the scale of being, we were willing to press his claims. But now, as the celestial gate to civil rights is slowly moving on its hinges, it becomes a serious question whether we had better stand aside and see, quote, Sambo, end quote, walk into the kingdom first. As self-preservation is the first law of nature, would it not be wiser to keep our lamps trimmed and burning and when the constitutional doors open, avail ourselves of the strong arm and blue uniform of the black soldier to walk in by his side and thus make the gap so wide that no privileged class could ever again close it against the humblest citizen of the republic? Quote, this is the Negro's hour, end quote. Are we sure that he, once entrenched in all his inalienable rights, may not be an added power to hold us at bay? Have not, quote, black male citizens, end quote, been heard to say they doubted the wisdom of extending the right of suffrage to women? Why should the African prove more just and generous than his Saxon compeers? If the two millions of Southern black women are not to be secured the rights of person, property, wages, and children, their emancipation is but another form of slavery. In fact, it is better to be the slave of an educated white man than of a degraded, ignorant black one. This letter to the editor of the New York Standard, dated December 26, 1865, was authored by Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Its indisputably racist ideas indicate that Stanton's understanding of the relationship between the battle for black liberation and the struggle for women's rights was, at best, superficial. She was determined, it seems, to prevent further progress for black people for, quote, Sambo, end quote, no less, if it meant that white women might not enjoy the immediate benefits of that progress. The opportunistic and unfortunately racist line of reasoning in the Stanton's letter to the Standard raises serious questions about the proposal to merge women's cause with the black cause that was made at the first women's right meeting since the eve of the Civil War. Held in New York City in May of 1866, the delegates to this women's rights convention decided to establish an equal rights association incorporating the struggles for black and women's suffrage into a single campaign. Many of the delegates no doubt understood the pressing need for unity, the kind of unity which would be mutually beneficial for black people and women alike. Susan B. Anthony, for example, insisted that it was necessary, quote, to broaden our women's rights platform and make it in name what it has always been in spirit, a human rights platform, end quote. Yet the influence of racism in the convention's proceedings was unmistakable. In one of the major addresses to the gathering, the well-known abolitionist Henry Ward Beecher argued that white, native-born, educated women have far more compelling claims for suffrage than did black people and immigrants, whom he portrayed in an obviously demeaning fashion. Quote, now place this great army of refined and cultivated women on the one side, and on the other side the rising cloud of emancipated Africans, and in front of them the great immigrant band of the Emerald Isle, and it is therefore force enough in our government to make it safe to give to the African and the Irishman the franchise? There is. We shall give it to them. And will our force all fall having done that? And shall we take the fairest and best part of our society, those to whom we owe it that we ourselves are civilized, our teachers, our companions, those to whom we go for counsel and trouble more than to any others, those to whom we trust everything that is dear to ourselves, our children's welfare, our household, our property, our name and reputation, and that which is deeper, our inward life itself, that no man may mention to more than one, shall we take them and say, quote, they are not, after all, fit to vote where the Irishman votes and where the African votes, end quote. I say, it is more important that women should vote than that the black man should vote, end quote. 
Beecher's remarks revealed the deep ideological links between racism, class bias, and male supremacy for the white women he praises are described in the language of the prevailing sexist stereotypes. At the first annual meeting of the Equal Rights Association in May 1867, Elizabeth Cady Stanton strongly echoed Henry Ward Beecher's argument that it was far more important for women, i.e. white Anglo-Saxon women, to receive the franchise than for black men to win the vote. Quote, with the black men, we have no new element in government, but with the education and elevation of women, we have a power that is to develop the Saxon race into a higher and nobler life and thus, by the law of attraction, to lift all races to a more even platform that can ever be reached in the political isolation of the sexes, end quote. The major issue at this convention was the impending enfranchisement of black men and whether the advocates of women's rights were willing to support black suffrage even if women were unable to achieve the vote simultaneously. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and others who believed that because, in their eyes, emancipation had rendered black people, quote, equal, end quote, to white women, the vote would render black men superior, were absolutely opposed to male suffrage, black male suffrage. Yet there were those who understood that the abolition of slavery had not abolished the economic oppression of black people, who therefore had a special and urgent need for political power. As Abby Kelly Foster disagreed with Stanton's logic, she asked this question, quote, Have we any true sense of justice? Are we not dead to the sentiment of humanity if we shall wish to postpone his security against present woes and future enslavement till woman shall obtain political rights? End quote. At the outbreak of the Civil War, Elizabeth Cady Stanton had urged her feminist colleagues to devote all their energies during the war years to the anti-slavery campaign. Later, she argued that women's rights advocates had committed a strategic error in subordinating themselves to the cause of abolitionism, alluding in her reminiscences to the, quote, six years women held their own claims in abeyance to those of the slaves in the South, end quote. She conceded that they were highly praised in Republican circles for their patriotic activism, quote, but when the slaves were emancipated, end quote, she lamented, quote, and these women asked that they should be recognized in the Reconstruction as citizens of the Republic, equal before law. All these transcendent virtues vanish like dew before the morning sun. End quote. According to Elizabeth Cady Stanton, the moral to be drawn from women's, i.e. white women's, Civil War experiences was that women should never, quote, labor to second man's endeavors and exalt his sex above her own. End quote. Uh, give me one second here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's take a moment to reflect on that. I think that one of the things that is very uh, enlightening to me about this is this sort of points to the 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 reasons or the, the some of the reasoning for division amongst movements as time has went on in a, American society. Uh, because of the divisiveness that have come, that has been used by political parties, it has uh, it, it it formed a a divide between uh, these uh, white women and the newly emancipated uh, uh, black people in the country, and that was a divide that was obviously here used by Republicans to further an agenda of theirs or used by political parties to further an agenda of theirs. And so I think that one thing that has to be uh, pointed out is that uh, this is not a, z a zero sum game uh, or zero sum. I think that's the right, I'm using that the right term, uh, but it's not a zero sum game. It's, it wasn't as if, if black people got the right to vote or if uh, they spoke about Irish uh Irish people in here here as well, if Irish immigrants, if they got the right to vote, that that meant it wasn't enough room for women to vote as well. Uh, just because, and that's one of the things that uh, was spoken about in the first part of this chapter in Elizabeth Cady Stanton's letter, she made it seem as if black people now being emancipated, if they got the right to vote, that that would make, that, that their right to vote being granted meant that somehow women's rights to vote shouldn't be wouldn't, wouldn't be granted as well or that for some reason that these things would need to happen at the same time uh and and in a, a, a perfect world uh 
they would happen at the same time. In a perfect world, there wouldn't be a set of people who don't have the right to vote while another set of people do have the right to vote. Uh, but, but, but since we aren't in a perfect world, in reality, in the world that existed, it wasn't as if uh, continuing to push forward the agenda to get black people the right to vote uh, meant that they, uh, an agenda couldn't also be pushed forward for women to have the right to vote, uh, be, especially because there are black women. And so just having just freeing uh, the slaves and emancipating the slaves was not simply enough, as we've seen through, as time would pass on, was not simply enough to keep them from the exploitation and the oppression and the racism that existed in the society. There had to be more things done to try to give them uh, equitability within the society. Uh, and. I don't think that you can ever try to pick one set of people to go first or one set of issues to go first. There shouldn't be a, a, an agenda or an order of importance for issues. Certain issues, of, especially of the uh, of the humanitarian kind, they are all of the utmost importance. And it just becomes important for different sets of people to be able to articulate the importance and the gravity of each issue uh, and then to be able to link the issues within each other. And so I think that one of the lessons to be learned from this is whether you you're you're uh fighting capitalism you're fighting uh, uh homophobia uh transphobia uh, ra po uh police terrorism mass incarceration uh climate control i'm not sure if i said that already uh, no matter which 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 of these things you are uh combating actively or, or or organizing against it's important to be able to have information and education on all of these different issues and to know how to articulate the intersectionality between all of these different issues so that way one issue can't be used in a divisive manner against another issue uh, thereby impeding both of those issues from getting the attention and the imp uh, uh, having the importance put on them that they need uh, so let's take a, another moment to stop this segment and then we'll finish up with one more segment uh, to end this episode. All right, let's wrap up this last segment for this episode, starting at the top of page 74. There was a strong element of political naivete in Stanton's analysis of the conditions prevailing at the war's end, which meant that she was more vulnerable than ever to racist ideology. As soon as the Union Army triumphed over their Confederate opponents, she and her co-workers insisted that the Republican Party reward them for their wartime efforts. The reward they demanded was women's suffrage, as if a deal had been made, as if women's rights proponents had fought for the defeat of slavery with the understanding that their prize would be the vote. Of course, the Republicans did not lend their support to women's suffrage after the Union victory was won, but it was not so much because they were men. It was rather because, as politicians, they were beholden to the dominant economic interest of the period. And so far as the military contest between the North and the South was a war to overthrow the Southern slaveholding class, it was a war which had been basically conducted in the interest of the Northern bourgeois, i.e. the young and enthusiastic industrial capitalists who found their political voice in the Republican Party. The Northern capitalists saw economic control over the entire nation. Their struggle against the Southern slaveocracy did not therefore mean that they supported the liberation of black women or black men or women as human beings. And I think one of the things I want to point out there is this sentence that Angela Davis uh, writes. But it was not so much because they were men. It was rather because as politicians, they were beholden to the dominant economic interest of the period. And I think that that's a commonality uh, among political figures. And I think that that's often why politicians or political figures are during the periods that they are in, a lot of times are seen in a elevated light or seen on an elevated platform. But as time passes and time goes on and you look back on some of the stances that they had or look back on some of the rhetoric that they espoused, a lot of those things don't age very well. A politician is the definition of somebody who is telling you the temperature of the room, uh, the definition of a thermometer telling you what the climate is like in the society at that current time. And the important part of activism and activists is that we should be uh, thermostats, not only able to tell what the temperature is of the time period and what the temperature is of the society and the climate of the society, but also able to uh, to adjust it and also able, willing to uh, make the attempt to try to adjust it. And so I just think that that's one of the things that uh, 
that sentence there does a great job of illustrating the difference between politicians and activists and why it's necessary to have activism since we have politicians. Okay, let's continue. If women's suffrage was not to be included in the post-war agenda of the Republican Party, neither were the innate political rights of black people of any real concern to these triumphant politicians. That they conceded the necessity of extending the vote to newly emancipated black men in the South did not imply that they favored black males over white females. Black male suffrage, as spelled out in the 14th and 15th constitutional amendments proposed by the Republicans, was a tactical move designed to ensure the political hegemony of the Republican Party in the chaotic post-war South. The Republican Senate leader, Charles Sumner, had been a passionate proponent of women's suffrage until the post-war period brought a sudden change in his attitude. The extension of the vote to women, he then insisted, was an, quote, inopportune, in quote, demand. In other words, quote, the Republicans wanted nothing to interfere with winning two million black votes for their party, end quote. When the Orthodox Republicans countered the post-war demand for women's suffrage with the slogan, quote, this is the Negroes hour, end quote, they were actually saying under their breaths, quote, this is the hour of two million more votes for our party, end quote. Yet Elizabeth Cady Stanton and her followers seemed to believe that it was the, quote, hour of the male, end quote, and that the Republicans were prepared to extend to black men the full privileges of male supremacy. When she was asked by a black delegate to the 1867 Equal Rights Convention whether she opposed the extension of the vote to black men unless women were also enfranchised, she answered, quote, I say no. I would not trust him with my rights. Degraded, oppressed himself, he would be more despotic than ever our Saxon rulers are, end quote. The principle of unity underlying the creation of the Equal Rights Association was undoubtedly beyond reproach. That Frederick Douglass agreed to serve as co-vice president with Elizabeth Cady Stanton, along with Lucretia Mott, who was elected president of the association, symbolized the serious nature of this search for unity. It seems nonetheless that Stanton and some of her co-workers unfortunately perceived the organization as a means to ensure that black men would not receive the franchise unless and until white women were also its recipients. When the Equal Rights Association resolved to agitate for the passage of the 14th Amendment, which curtailed the apportionment, apportionment of congressional representatives in accordance with the number of male citizens denied the right to vote in federal elections, These white women felt fundamentally betrayed. After the association voted to support the 15th Amendment, which prohibited the use of race, color, or previous condition of servitude as a basis for denying citizens the right to vote, the internal friction erupted into open and strident ideological struggle. As Eleanor Flexner put it, quote, Stanton's indignation and that of Miss Anthony knew no bounds. The latter made the pledge that, quote, I will cut off this right arm of mine before I will ever work for or demand the ballot for the Negro and not the woman, end quote. Mrs. Stanton made derogatory references to, quote, Sambo, end quote, and the enfranchisement of, quote, Africans, Chinese, and all the ignorant foreigners the moment they touch our shores, end quote. She warned that the Republicans' advocacy of manhood suffrage, quote, creates an antagonism between black men and all women that will culminate in fearful outrages on womanhood, especially in the southern states, end quote. Whether the criticism of the 14th Amendment and 15th Amendments expressed by the leaders of the women's rights movement was justifiable or not is still being debated. But one thing seems clear. Their defense of their own interest as white middle class women in a frequently egotistical and elitist fashion exposed the tenuous and superficial nature of their relationship to the post-war campaign for black equality. Granted, the two amendments excluded women from the new process of enfranchisement and were thus interpreted by them as detrimental to their political aims. Granted, they felt they had as powerful a case for suffrage as black men. Yet in articulating their opposition with arguments invoking the privileges of white supremacy, they revealed how defenseless they remained, even after years of involvement in progressive causes, to the pernicious ideological influence of racism. And I think we'll end this episode on uh, on that note there. One of the things I want to reflect on on that passage we just read is, 
right, this last, that one of those last sentences. Yet in articulating their opposition with arguments invoking the privileges of white supremacy, they revealed how defenseless they remain to the pernicious ideological influence of racism. And I think that that's one of the things that is important about intersectionality. One of the things that's important about uh, being able, being informed and educated about other causes that have connections to yours or, or as a subjugated group or as a marginalized groups, being informed and educated about other subjugated and marginalized groups within the society. It does the it, it helps to do the job so that when you are articulating your particular cause, you don't do the work of of putting down another cause. I think too often we have what I, I, I deem oppression Olympics where somebody is uh, uh, trying as they're trying to advocate for why uh, black people are are don't have an equitable stance in a society. They step on uh, women or they step on uh, uh, trans folks or uh, tra- uh, the LGBTQ plus community or they may step on uh, the Hispanic community, Latino community, Asian community, Middle Eastern community. And uh, I think that one of the things that is used against subjugated groups and marginalized groups is other groups and whichever the power structure or the powers that be are very good at being able to, as we're seeing here, for political aims, play two different groups against each other or promise one thing to a certain group at, in this moment and later on another group can get it once this group has it. And and that divisiveness, that division, what it ultimately does is it serves the uh, betterment of the people doing the subjugation, of the people doing the marginalization, of the people doing the exploiting and the oppressing. And it continues to keep the people being oppressed and exploited and marginalized and subjugated, uh, fighting and quarreling amongst each other instead of putting their energy towards uh, the the proper institutions or the, the proper people or the proper systems that they should be pointed at. And that's what we're seeing here is that really the, the all of this uh, disagreement and and uh, dialogue should all be pointed towards the white male elitist class that is keeping both women subjugated, oppressed and exploited and black people subjugated, uh, uh, exploited and oppressed. And 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 I just think that it's very important to uh, as much as it's important to be informed and educated about your personal identity, uh, politics of your identity. It's also important to be informed and educated about uh, politics that may be outside of your identity, but with the understanding that once you under, uh, once you have become informed about those uh, politics that are outside of your identity, it strengthens your identity politics. It strengthens uh, the, the stances and the issues that you are uh, struggling for because all of these things are intertwined. All of these things do have connections with each other. And so I think that that's where I want to end it on. I also want to say, I think that one of the things that is important about these history lessons and it, that, and this is what, uh, Angela Davis is giving to us towards throughout this book is a, a history lesson, uh, but also philosoph- phil- giving some of her phil- philosophy and ideology around these issues. But it, it, it goes to show a, a fuller spectrum of some of the people who uh, mainstream America put in a high uh, stance or a high caliber. And Susan B. Anthony, as we've seen here, somebody who is whenever... Uh, Whenever women's the women's rights movements or women's suffrage is talked about, Susan B. Anthony is is regularly put on this high pedestal. And I do think that just like multiple historical figures in the past, everybody is going to have some prisoner of their time or some uh, negative characteristic that is because of the time that they existed in. But I think that it's important to also point out those characteristics as well as their positive characteristics. And it was clear here that even though Susan B. Anthony was against the uh, monstrosity that was slavery, she was not against the monstrosity that was racist ideology. And so that is just something to keep regularly in your mind when Susan B. Anthony is being put on this pedestal on this platform. And we've already seen from Frederick Douglass how Somebody can have a certain stance, but can that stance being challenged, they can adjust that stance. And I think that those are the historical figures that we must put at the at the the elevate as high as possible. So on that note, we're going to end this episode of Rafa Reading Daily. We'll come back 
tomorrow and finish up chapter four and move into chapter five of Angela Y. Davis, Women, Race, and Class. So please share this on whatever platform you're listening to it on. And remember, we put these episodes out on a daily basis to provide people the opportunity to begin and further their journey in the struggle to end police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice. We outside.